Are you looking to get out of debt, build wealth, and find the path to financial freedom? Well then stay tuned. Welcome to High Tech Redneck Money, where we help you navigate an ever-changing financial world. Just a quick channel update. If you go to the website at all, uh, you'll see that I have a new book out on Amazon. It goes over a lot of the concepts we'll talk about today and want to give you a little update. Sorry, I haven't been posting here lately. I've been pretty busy trying to get that book out through publishing and for sale, and then also did some updates to the website to make it a little easier to navigate, and also been just working around the shop in the house trying to get some stuff fixed and ready to go. All right, let's count down the top 10 wealth building principles from all of the biggest financial gurus and experts. I've been diving into how to trade, how to make money, how to build wealth, how to get out of debt, all the, uh, the big gurus that you could think of, Warren Buffett, Dave Ramsey, Tony Robbins, Robert Kiyosaki, Kiyosaki, probably pronounced that wrong. Sorry if I did. Uh, Suze Orman, uh, some YouTube personalities such as uh, Meet Kevin, Graham Stephan, uh, Jaspreet Singh, um, anybody else you could throw on the list. These are kind of the top 10 things that they all agree on, counting down from the hardest to the easiest. With that, let's get into it. Number 10, understand and manage risk. What are we talking about? We're recognizing and trying to mitigate financial risks to protect our investments. Why is this number 10? Because you have to have investments in the first place before this is a factor. And to get there, you kind of have to do some of the first few off of this list. So a couple of quick quotes. Warren Buffett says, risk comes from not knowing what you're doing. And Tony Robbins says that by diversifying and managing risk effectively, you can avoid catastrophic losses that set you back for years. Now, when we talk about risk management, what are some of the things we're talking about? Uh, mostly you were talking about portfolio uh, diversification. You can also talk about hedging, using financial instruments like options to offset the risk of your investments or mitigate the downside, like uh, selling a call on something you know is going to go down or buying a put on assets that you already have will hedge against the downside risk. Number nine is invest in assets that generate income. So there are several different types of assets that generate income. Most of the time when you're talking about this, though, you're talking about rental properties, dividend stocks, or ETFs that give you dividends, and annuities. These are the main things that people talk about as far as income stocks. And then you also have to decide whether you reap the income or you reinvest it as the growth strategy for your portfolio in that case. A quick couple of quotes, uh, Robert Kiyosaki, it's not how much money you make, but how much money you keep and how hard it works for you and how many generations you keep it. And then also Grant Cardone, investing in real estate is like riding a bicycle. You can fall, but once you learn, you never forget. Number eight, diversify investments. This also applies to number 10, but we need to go into more detail. You want to take, uh, if we look at a conventional risk asset allocation, uh, if you take all of your portfolio, all of your net worth, and you look at a 75-25 risk out asset allocation, you want to have 25% free, like risk-free treasuries, uh, gilts, uh, trusts, you know, cash basically, or cash, you know, high yield savings account would also be a good one. Um, and then 75% you want to put in risk assets, which is the portfolio that you're actually talking about. And a balanced portfolio 
conventional wisdom says 60% stocks, 30% bonds, 10% real estate. Um, you can also find the, uh, the age rule where you take your age and subtract it from 100. And that's how much you should have in stocks and how much you should have in bonds. Uh, so like if you're 40, then you want to have 60% in stocks, 40% in bonds. Um, and you know, if you're doing real estate, I would put that on the bond side. So take part of the bond side into real estate because it's less risky than stocks, but it's also less return. Another type of diversification is regional diversification. So you invest in markets and ETFs that are outside of your country or outside of your economy. Like in the US, we would typically diversify out into like Chinese stocks or European stocks or, uh, you know, into crypto, which is a totally different market, a worldwide market. Number seven, have a long term perspective. Uh, stay the course with your investments. Don't panic during market downturns. Uh, the concept of dollar cost averaging is a big component of this step or number. Uh, typically during downturns, instead of selling your assets, you would hedge or, uh, you know, buy puts, sell calls so that, uh, you're mitigating your downside risk. And then also if you're continuing to buy or invest, then you're lowering your cost basis because no matter how much the stock market goes down, it always goes back up eventually. So having a long-term outlook basically means just don't sweat the downturns, turn them into profit. Here's a couple of quotes. Uh, Warren Buffett says that someone sitting in the shade today is because someone planted a tree a long time ago. And then if we look at Peter Lynch, another big time investor expert, in the long run, it's not just how much money you make that will determine your future prosperity. It's how much of that money you put to work by saving and investing it. Number six, plan for retirement. For most people, this just means opening a 401k or an IRA and contributed contributing regularly. But what a lot of people don't talk about is why you actually want to plan for retirement. Uh, you're typically the wealth you make over your life is concentrated between 20 and about 60 years old. So 40 years of your life, you, you accumulate 75% of your wealth. So during that time, you want to set aside some to take care of the rest of your life. You know, I don't know how long you'll live, neither do you probably, but typically you'll be retired for at least 20 years, maybe 40 years, maybe longer. And during those years, post 60, you're going to be making less money or no money at all if you're retired. So you need to set aside money to take care of that time of your life while you are in the prime. A couple of quotes, just real quick. Chris Hogan says, retirement is not an age, it's a financial number. And Suze Orman also says, it's never too early to start planning for retirement. Number five, invest early and regularly. Uh, the earlier you start investing, the more time you have to take advantage of compound interest. Compound interest is basically the old saying that time in the market beats timing the market. And that's because the longer you have an investment accumulating interest, especially if you're regularly contributing to it, the quicker it grows because you set up an exponential scaling. So if you have a thousand dollars in a savings account, basically gives you no interest 10 years from now it's still a thousand dollars because fees will probably eat up any interest that you're getting paid if you put it in a high yield savings account that pays you say five percent then with the rule of 72 you divide 72 by five and you will get 14 and a half years for that investment to double 
So at the end of 10 years, that $1,000 and a 5% high yield savings account will actually be $1,600 and about $50. And if you stretch that out even farther, basically every 14 years, that $1,000 will double or 14 and a half years. So compound interest is a really big thing. The earlier you start, the more compound interest works for you. And the less you have to worry about it, uh, the more normalized the contributions become. If you've been doing it for 20 years, by the time you're 40, it doesn't bother you to have, you know, a couple hundred bucks out of every check go directly into your retirement. Number four, educate yourself financially. Uh, There's one of the big problems with our education system is that it teaches you a lot of, you know, your basic arithmetic, basic English. Uh, it tries to teach you a lot of advanced skills. And if you continue it through college, it's supposed to basically get you ready for life in the real world, but it never really teaches you about money. You have to educate yourself financially. You have to learn about stocks, you know, interest investments, 401ks, IRAs. Uh, there's a lot of resources that you can use to continue your education, especially your financial knowledge. Uh, You can go to books. I have a book that you can try out. Uh, There'll be a link in the description. You can do online trainings. You can go on YouTube. I mean, you're here now watching this video. Continuous development and learning is a lifelong pursuit. And one of the more important places that you can focus that energy is becoming financially literate learning how to invest, how to trade, how to make money, how money works, where it comes from, how interest works, how savings works, how the banking system works. Those are all going to help you a lot in your life, and they're not something you're going to learn in school. So you have to go after that education on your own. Number three, get out of debt and stay out of debt. This is where a lot of the gurus focus their biggest part of their time or you know make their biggest impact for people if you're deep in debt it's a hole that digs itself after a while and it's hard to get out of like dave ramsey sue zorman tony robbins a lot of these experts that's where they start you off at get out of debt stay out of debt there are a lot of different methods for getting out of debt the debt snowball effect the debt avalanche method the Debt consolidation. Debt consolidation is a little bit outside of the other. Those are methods. Debt consolidation is actually where you go to a financial institution and pay off all your debt with a loan so that you only have one payment at a lower interest rate. Smart, but it's not always the best option if you can do, if you can pay down your debt otherwise. A couple of quick quotes Dave Ramsey, pretty much every one of his shows, he says, debt is dumb, cash is king. While not all debt is dumb, a lot of what we spend anymore on credit cards and buy now, pay later schemes and things like that, that is dumb. They're not really talking about like mortgages or small business loans or something like that. They're more talking about credit cards and buy now, pay later schemes. Uh, another quote from Sue Orman, the only way you ever permanently take control of your financial life is to dig deep and fix the root problem, which is usually spending more than you make. We're getting down to the nitty gritty now. Number two, build an emergency fund. Why do you want to do this? Well, especially right now, as we're looking at a recession looming, you want to aim to save at least three to six months worth of living expenses. Sue Zorman, I believe, actually says eight Uh, Because that's the average time it takes somebody to go from one high paying career to finding another after they lose their job is about eight months. But they also say, well, you should do this, start small and build up gradually and focus on getting out of debt first. A couple of quick quotes. The first step to financial independence is to save $1,000 as quickly as possible. And that's a quote from Dave Ramsey. And all of the experts and gurus typically 
are going to tell you save a portion of your income regularly to cover unexpected expenses. The first step of not living paycheck to paycheck is saving some of the previous paycheck. Sue Zorman uh, says, I want to have an eight month emergency fund because that is how long it takes the average person to find a job. So that's a quote directly from her. And it's just smart in general. You want to maintain this emergency fund. You don't want to invest it. So once you've built up the emergency fund, then what you would be putting in that emergency fund, you want to invest either in retirement or income generating assets, you know, rental properties, uh, dividend income, if you don't want the headache of rental properties, or you can invest in ETFs, REITs that actually do the rental for you and you just collect a dividend. Okay. We're getting down to the number one. I just want to touch base on a couple of things. I would like for you guys to put a comment down in the comment section on some other ideas. Uh, if you have some points that weren't on here or some ideas for videos related to this or unrelated questions, I don't care. Just uh, for everybody to learn, you need a dialogue. So if you would, Put a comment down there. And now we get to the number one. What's the number one tip? Live below your means. You have to figure out what your expenses are, what your income is, and budget, whether that's on a spreadsheet or, you know, a an app like Bridget or Mint or there's a big list of other apps that you can use to figure out what you're making, what you're spending it on, and just the act of that, once you see what you're spending your money on, you'll look at it and go, oh, here's this, you know, 50 bucks a month I'm paying for some streaming service that I don't use anymore. Cut it out. And after a while, you're not living paycheck to paycheck anymore. You're actually having a surplus that you can put towards things. Initially, you want to put it mostly towards your debt. Some of it you want to put towards an emergency fund. Once you get three to six months of an emergency fund saved up, then you want to start diverting that into investments. Whether that's a high-yield savings account until you have enough money to buy a rental, or whether that's putting it into a 401k or an IRA, or what other retirement instrument that you like, that's up to you. You want to spend less than you earn and control your expenses. As Dave Ramsey says, like no, live like no one else now, so later you can live like no one else. Put away some of your income now instead of spending it so that later on you can spend it when you don't have income. And as far as Sue Zorman, a big part of financial freedom is having your heart and mind free from worry about the what ifs in life. So covering your bases beforehand that you don't have to worry about when things happen. All right, guys, I hope you liked that 10 to 1 uh, top 10 financial tips from all the biggest YouTube and mainstream media financial experts. Another thing I want to update you for, I've updated the website. There's now forums for you to drop in and post on, react to, do whatever you want. I have a book out now coming out on Amazon called the top 10 steps from debt to financial freedom it uh, goes over kind of what we went over here but in much greater detail uh, with some case studies to explain some of the concepts it goes in order of easiest to the hardest so you can kind of work through it it also gives you some worksheets for creating a budget tracking down your expenses and income and also trying to tackle debt uh, there's a couple of worksheets for debt snowball effect or debt avalanche method and then also there is a list of further reading uh, different books for specific parts of this list and also uh, good resources just for continuing your education so all right thanks for sticking around remember to like subscribe comment share all that stuff and i'll catch you on the next one